I'm not going to share announcements because my brain doesn't work that way this morning. Uh, but there are places that you can find out where things are happening. There is our Church of the Brethren Nampa website, uh, which I encourage you to check out. There is the newsletter, the bridge that comes out. If you don't get that, um, let us know and we'll get you hooked up with that. I do want to let you know, though, if, if you move, tell us. Because we'll just keep sending it to your old address. Um, and pretty soon, four or five months down the road, we get a whole stack of them back that says they're not there anymore. So uh, just a little clerical thing, an encouragement to uh, let us know if you are happen to be going from one place to another. Um, and also in your bulletin, you'll see that there's a list of announcements that are, of things that are coming up. Um, I'm just happy to be here in the Lord's house with you all today. It's a blessing. Carlene, you've been in our service today. Thank you, and it's good to be here with you today, um, September 24, and uh, you're, you're feeling it, aren't you? There's a little nip in the air. I got here, and I looked at Dave, and I said, I probably should have put that jacket on. Um, today's sermon, I noticed, is start as you mean to go, and I looked at that and thought, I'm always talking about the race up here. So how are you doing running your race? Thank you for being here today to spur and encourage each other on. In Bible study, we learned, um, we've been studying Acts 2, that just kind of all came together. John's preaching Acts here, and we're studying Acts there, and so I'm getting axed. Does that make sense? <laughs> it is so good. It is so good. But we have learned that we are still in the time of the Lord's favor, meaning what they started back then in Acts, we are still doing today. We are still the witnesses. We are still out there shining the light on the gospel. And the gospel teaches us how to live. And it's good to know the times in which we're running this race, right? A lot of it's kind of the same as what it was back then. And I've, I've been reading a lot, and I came across someone named A.W. Tozer. Maybe, maybe several of you have heard of him. Um, but he said, has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord tuned not to each other but to another standard which each one must bow so 100 worshipers meeting together each one looking away to christ are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be so that one stood out at me and then i come across Dr. Caroline Leaf, who is a neurologist of 40 years, and she does um, a lot of looking at the brain and worship in the brain. She has a specific study out there, and she said, put your hand on your heart. When we sing and worship together, all of our hearts sync up to the power of God's energy and we are beating as one heart. Beautiful, isn't it? And then you go back to David, King David. He instituted music in the temple. And I found it just really interesting um, that he wrote, or that it is written throughout many scriptures that worship should involve the whole person and music helps life, helps lifts a person's thoughts and emotions to God. Now that's David in the Old Testament. Interesting, isn't it, how the New Testament, not the New Testament, that science, Caroline Leaf, the neurologist, they're finally catching up and proving the gospel and the Bible right. It just feels good. So thank you for being here. Um, let us pray. Father, 
Thank you for bringing us together for worship with you. As we run this race put before us, may we boldly and accurately live out for God in all that we say and do. Be with those who cannot be with us today. To you be the glory and honor forever. Amen. And I don't know why and how. I, yes, I do too. I'll just go with it. I have the privilege of reading Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9, which are just awesome. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Thank you. Good morning. It's animal print day. <laughs> Do hymns hold memories for you, specific memories? This first hymn that we're going to sing does for me. It's called With Happy Voices Singing. And when I was a kid, Pat, Mark, you might remember too, this is the hymn that we would come into Bible school for the singing in the group time. Do you remember it? So this just triggers that memory for me. And it's happy voices, folks, so we're going to sing with happy voices. Please stand and sing with me. As we prepare for our offering today, Acts 20, verse 35 says, In everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work, remembering the words Lord Jesus himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive.
Heavenly Father, we wholeheartedly dedicate these gifts to the continued work of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Carleen. Kids, come on up. Well, you got all kinds of stuff. Nice. You guys had John Chuck. Come sit down. Good morning. You've got an animal print dress on too. That is the, the day, apparently. So, I got a question for you. Well, it's not really a question. It's kind of more of a statement. It's a confession. Okay, I'm going to tell you something about me. Blah, blah. I am not perfect. Is anyone shocked by that? No. 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 <laughs> Good. I'm glad you're not surprised by that. I make mistakes. And I was thinking about uh, some of the things that I did, and some of them I, do, I don't really want to tell you about, but I did find one that I would like to tell you about, okay? When I was little, I don't know, maybe, maybe about that size, uh, my dad had a shovel that he kept in a, a little compartment in his pickup, just a little shovel like this, okay? And while he was out irrigating, one, is he here? Okay, I can tell the story. Um, while he was out irrigating one time, I was staying at the, by the truck, and I got into the compartment, and I got the little shovel out, and I was just digging away, dig, 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 dig. And I had shut the compartment, and then when he came back, we got in the truck, and we left. And I left that shovel there on the side of the road, on, by the ditch. And you know what? I didn't say anything about it. Because I was afraid that I was going to be in trouble. Now, do you think it was wrong for me to use that shovel? No, it was okay for me to use the shovel. Do you think it was wrong for me not to tell anybody about the fact that I'd left it there? Yes. Absolutely. You know why? Because it's important for us to tell the truth. Do you guys think it's important to tell the truth? Do you always tell the truth? You're in church. Do you, let me ask you an easier question. Is it sometimes hard to tell the truth? It is. I know this. I've experienced this myself. It was hard for me to say what I should have said which was, oh, Dad, I left, the sh I left that shovel there, which I should have done. What are you doing, you silly? <laughs> so, even though it's hard to tell the truth, I want to encourage you all to make sure that you do. It's better, you won't get in as much trouble if you tell the truth than if you leave things alone. I know this from experience. But more importantly, we tell the truth because God, who we serve, is truthful. And he wants us to be like him. You think you guys can handle that? Nope. No, you can't be like God. You can be a little bit like God. Kind of. kind of like God. A little more like God maybe than we were yesterday. Working our way towards this. And knowing that, you know what? It's important for us to tell the truth. Even when it's difficult. Uh, can we do that? I'm going to get a commitment out of you. Yeah. Well, we'll pray about it then, okay? Let's pray. Lord, we know that telling the truth is important. We know that being honest is important because it is how you are with us. You never lie to us. There's no deceit in your mouth. You're always truthful and faithful. And we want to be as much as we can like you. And so we ask for your spirit to help us do that and give us the courage whenever we have things that we need to say that we'd be able to say them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. You guys can go down. Oh, he found out. Yeah. Stand with me. We're going to sing Guide My Feet, 546. One through six. I remembered this time.
page, read out my vision. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my vision, O thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great thought, child may I be. Thou in me dwelling, and I one with thee. Be thou my buckler, my sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight. Thou my soul's shelter, thou my high tower. Raise thou me heavenward, O power of my power. Riches I heed not, nor vain empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, thou and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart. My King of them, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven. Thank you, Marianne. That's one of my favorites. That, it's a beautiful song, beautiful harmonies. Don't pry too deeply into my confessions. I want to read today from Acts chapter 5, our text. I do want to pick it up in the fourth chapter because there's a little bit there in the fourth chapter that makes this story out of Acts 5 make more sense. And so we did look at it last week, and so I want to just uh, do a little exposition here. So beginning in the 36th verse of that fourth chapter, Luke writes, there was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him and then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And then chapter 5. But a man named Ananias, with the consent of his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property with his wife's knowledge. He kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. And now when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. And great fear, and I think literal fear here, seized all who heard of it. The young men came and wrapped up his body, and they carried him out and buried him. And after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. 
And then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down at his feet and died. And when the young men came in, they found her dead, so they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And again, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard of these things. That is a terrible story. That's awful. I mean, ooh. You know, it's a wonder that the church really got anywhere if this is the sort of thing that's going on in it. I mean, two prominent members, two significant figures, a couple who had means, standing in the community, resources, property, struck dead in the matter of a couple of hours. Right in front of everybody. And it's not like the reason was a secret either. It's not like people went out in the hallway going, what's going on? What happened? We don't know why this is going on. Peter is very explicit here in the text. He's clear about it. To Ananias, he says, you did not lie to us, but to God. And Ananias drops dead. How is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? He asks Sapphira, and then, bam, she's dead. So it's pretty clear. Lying to God, putting the Spirit to the test, that has consequences. I mean, look at this from the standpoint of somebody that wasn't part of the church, that maybe was looking at it from the outside, wondering if they wanted to be a part of this, a, a potential believer. What's it going to say to you if, you if you know that there's a spirit in this new thing, this new community, that can strike you down if you lie to it? It's not a great recruiting message, really, when you think about it. Come join our church. And by the way, deception is fatal. Well, there's a lot going on here in this story, and, and we probably shouldn't look at it from that standpoint, the standpoint of a of its impact on a potential believer. It's not really an evangelical message, even though every potential believer should absolutely know what they're in for when they give their heart to Jesus. It's also a very clear and true picture of God, who is not only loving, but also just. The reality is that this is a message for the church, the believers. It's, a, it's an in-house communication, if you will. And since it is for us, well, we need to listen. We need to pay attention. Why does Luke tell us this story if it's not just to scare us into telling the truth? Well, truth does have a lot to do with it. It's right at the center of this story. We'll get to that a little later. But to begin with, we might look at the position of this story and the bigger story that Luke is telling. Again, remember from last week, we talked a little bit about this, this picture of the early church where they were all sharing life together. They were, they were sharing resources. They had all things in common. And, and how this one guy that we, we read about just a moment ago, Joseph of Cyprus, the, the apostles had nicknamed him Barnabas, the son of encouragement, how he had sold some of his property, sold some land, and then brought the money in and, and gave it to the church. That's Luke's way of setting up this story here in chapter 5. It's the exposition of what's going to happen here. And as we pointed out last week, uh, there was a certain way that people were wired back in those days, a way that they thought about things when it came to resources. People did want to accumulate things, but it wasn't just for the sake of the things. It wasn't just about getting more money. What they were after was honor. Honor. Honor was the way that you got power. Honor was the way that you were able to control situations. The people that had the most honor, they were the ones in charge. They were the ones calling the shots. This is the deal with the religious leaders. It's why they were concerned about when Jesus started to become more influential and why they couldn't just go out and try to do away with him. They would have decrease their honor if they uh, confronted Jesus because his popularity happened to be on the rise in the time. It's that Roman nobleman that we talked about last week. It's what he was after when he donated money to, to build a temple or to pave a road. He wanted honor. 
Money was a way to get there. It was a way to purchase honor. You understand this, right? This is, this, this is a pretty simple process here. And it's what Ananias and Sapphira were after. Honor. When Barnabas sells his property and he donates the proceeds to the church, something interesting happens. It probably wasn't his intent. He doesn't come off as the kind of guy that would really be into this kind of thing. But he gained some honor. People looked at him differently. Perhaps they respected him a little bit more. They saw him as, as more generous than they'd previously known him to be or thought of him. And, and because it was simply the way that people thought about things, Ananias and Sapphira saw this, and they saw it as an opportunity to gather some honor for themselves. We can get some of that, they say to each other. Do the same sort of thing that Barnabas does, does and, and they're going to treat us like Barnabas, with honor. But there's this little problem, this little hitch in that plan. See, they don't want to give up the money either. They want to hold on to that, and so they hatch this plan, and let's be honest, it's not really that much of a plan. It's pretty simple. They sell the land, they bring in part of the money, and then they just claim that it's the whole amount, which is interesting to me because I'm like, it's like, that much? I think you could have gotten a lot more, but whatever. They sell it, they bring the money in, it's their way of having their cake and eating it too. They get the benefit of the honor that comes when you donate the proceeds to the church, but also the benefit of hanging on to that money and using it for whatever you want. It's not complicated. And you know what? It would work, too, if nobody had found out. But there are miracles in this story. The miraculous part of the story, the first one is that, you know, there are no secrets from God. God sees everything. He saw everything that Ananias and Sapphira did. He saw what was in their hearts. God knew exactly their sin. And God is just. For those who, who think that this is a, a disproportionate sort of punishment for what seems to be a garden variety deception... Frankly, I kind of lean that way myself. Remember, it's not Peter here. It's not the apostles judging and doling out punishment. It's God. God is the actor in this story. God is the agent in this story. So if you've got a beef with this judgment and the execution of justice, you're going to have to take it up with God. But in the story, you see, there's no real way for Peter to have known that Ananias was coming in with only part of the money, claiming it was all of it. He has to be told this. It has to be revealed to him by the Spirit of God. That's a miracle, folks. There's another miracle. The miracle here, and it's a scary miracle, but it's a miracle nonetheless. It is God himself who dispenses this judgment. It is God who executes the punishment. You think about it, there were numerous capital crimes in the Jewish law, and if for Jews, the, the, the punishment would probably be stoning. But you know what? There would have been human hands holding on to those stones before they were thrown. For the Romans, it would have been crucifixion, but there would have been soldiers who were holding the hammer and the nails, driving them home into the cross. But here, we have God himself taking care of this, which, if anything, is a little more unsettling. God only, not only knows who deserves punishment perfectly, but God ultimately dispenses that judgment and that justice. There's a lot of truths in this story, and this is a central one. This is God doing God's business. Like I said, part of me struggles with that. I struggle trying to get the punishment to fit the crime here. It seems pretty harsh. Death for lying. And even though I got to accept it, I got to accept that it's God who's making the call here, it still makes me uncomfortable. Now one way that I've tried to deal with this seemingly disproportionate nature of this is by 
recognizing the necessity of starting as you mean to go. See, if the church had not dealt with this initial deception conclusively, firmly, or more appropriately, if God hadn't taught them this particular lesson about integrity right from the start, then who knows where the church would have gone. Human nature being what it is, uh, it's not hard to imagine that Ananias and Sapphira, having gotten away with this initial deception, would have gone on to do it again and again and again. And because this is not the kind of thing that stays hidden for very long, others would have found out about it. They would have seen it as their own path to honor, and they may have been tempted to do the same, to try to keep a little for themselves, gather a little honor without a whole lot of investment. The church could have descended into deception, one false gift after another. And then how do you put that toothpaste back in the tube? How do you rein that back in when it's already out of control? So you deal with the deception right away, conclusively. And you got less of an issue in the future. Because integrity is so critical to the life of the church, its importance needs to be established as a bedrock principle from day one. Maybe when I get the feeling like this punishment is excessive, maybe that's because I'm not taking integrity seriously enough. Which is where we make the turn. You see, built into this story, there's some presuppositions. First of all, God is trying to tell us something here. There's a a message, there's a lesson for us here, absolutely. Next, because God is the one who is the prime actor in this whole story, again, it's not Peter or the apostles who are judging and punishing, it's God. We need to look at what happens here, the things that God does, as and, and treat them as authoritative. It's the right thing. What God does here is just and righteous by definition because God is the one doing it. And so we got to set aside our preconceptions about lying and whatever the appropriate punishment might happen to be for lying. Because, you know, we're more likely to let ourselves off the hook here <laughs> than we should be. We like to grade on a curve, don't we? Uh, we, like to, we like to rank our sin as, as well, this is more serious sin, and, and that's let, you know how we define more serious and less serious? More serious is what somebody else is doing. Less serious is what we're doing. But we like that. A little, a little garden variety deception that shouldn't result in a death sentence, we think, but this is what the story tells us. It tells us that our ideas of the consequences of sin, deception in this case, those aren't necessarily God's ideas. You see, God seems to take all of this sin stuff a lot more seriously than we do. Now this this, this story certainly points out the fact that lying is serious business. And so we're faced with the question, if our ideas about sin and God's ideas about sin don't line up, who's right? If our ideas don't line up with God's ideas, who is right? Yes. It's not me. (laughs) It's God. So, the story points out the severity and the significance of deception. Do we want to look at this as as some kind of a one-off, weird thing that happened, an outlier? Or is this really at the heart of what God thinks about integrity? Think about it. It's a lot more likely that God is being gracious and kind and forgiving when we're not struck down every time that we sin. God's grace doesn't somehow change how serious sin is. Ananias and Sapphira were simply, they simply received in real time what we all deserve but for the grace of God. God's forbearance, it should never lead us to believe that any kind of sin is no big deal. 
Now, I don't want you to get the impression that this is a fire and brimstone today. Uh, that's, not, that's not what I'm trying to do here. Uh, my intention, it's not to put the fear into you that the Spirit of God's going to do that if necessary. My hope is that we'll look at this story and as a result, just take integrity seriously. We need to tell the truth. Not to read too much into this, but, but why is this story even here? Why would Luke, through the leading of the Spirit, tell us a story about the consequences of deception in particular? Of all of the different sins that you could imagine that could have derailed the church, why is lying to the Spirit, why is that the one that gets Ananias and Sapphira in trouble? Could it be that truthfulness is at the very heart of our identity as the people of God? You see, if we are nothing else as Christians, we're supposed to be a people of integrity. And this all begins with the character of God. It's who God is. God is ultimately truthful. All the way back at the very beginning, almost to the very beginning, in, in the book of Numbers, we, we hear the words, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should have to repent. He, has he said and it will not, he will not do it? Has he spoken and he will not make it good? See, while we're faithless and, and, and untrustworthy, God is faithful and trustworthy in all things. God tells the truth. And so God is worthy of our trust. You see, God keeps promises. Every single one God keeps. When God says something, it happens. It comes to pass. This is the character of God. No deceit, no deception, no lies, no falsehoods. And so naturally, in order for the people of God to really reflect that character of God, then that has to be us too. We have to be a people of integrity. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus recognizes deceit as an evil thing that comes from within a person. It, 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 it defiles a person. Peter, in 1 Peter 2, says that Jesus himself was free of sin and no deceit was in his mouth. Jesus, who is the Word made flesh, full of grace and truth. Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And so we get this picture from Scripture. The Bible shows us the truthfulness of God and of His Son Jesus and the Spirit of truth that is promised to believers. And we know that those who are called by God and redeemed by Jesus and empowered by the Spirit will be a people of truth. It's a defining characteristic just as it is for God now one of the primary accusations leveled at the church people study this they go out and they, they ask questions and they say what's your beef with the church <laughs> what's your concern why do you not go why did you leave it behind what is it that's caused you to reject it one of the primary accusations is hypocrisy it's right up at the top of the list. They don't do what they say. They don't love when they say that love is important. They don't forgive when forgiveness is key. They claim that we, as a people of truth, don't tell the truth. And the scandals that have ripped the church apart the sexual abuse by clergy, the theft of resources that are held in trust, the corruption and abuse at all levels, these scandals, they're not just sins of lust and greed and covetousness. They are sins of deception. Hypocrisy is a sin of lying. People in the church, we're going to mess up. I know that probably doesn't come as a surprise. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to sin. Uh, it's going to happen. And if we deal with that sin rightly, honestly, with integrity and love and forgiveness, then no charge of hypocrisy could stick. 
because we're doing exactly what it is we are meant to do. But when we lie about it, when we, when we cover it up, when we pretend that eh, it's no big deal, well, that very lack of integrity makes people question if we do belong to a God who is truthful and trustworthy. Either we can't be trusted, or more tragically, they think God can't be trusted because of the behavior of his people. Now, the most precious truth is one that is tempered by love. It is truth that is presented with the good of the beloved in mind. So we're not talking about throwing truth bombs all over the place. You know what I'm talking about, those, those people that, I'm just going to tell you like it is. Yeah, they create dissension and division and pain with that injudicious application of the truth, what they call the truth. We need to be kind in our truth-telling, but we absolutely need to tell the truth. You see, a community that is built on deception can never stand. It'll never last. It won't go anywhere. A community that can't trust its own members is not a community at all. As Peter tells Ananias, it was his land and his money to do what he wanted with. There was no obligation there that might have motivated him to lie about it. There was just that selfish greed and the desire for honor that led to the deception. And you can't build a church on that. You can't build anything on that, and God knew it. Integrity is essential. You have to have truth for the community just to survive, just to exist, to say nothing of thriving. And so it has to start out that way in no uncertain terms. The church has to be a place where truth is honored and deception has consequences. So what do we learn from this? I learned that I'm happy that I'm not there. That's serious business. But more deeply than that, we, we learn that, that God is concerned with integrity. That's where we start. Don't, don't, please don't, don't think that God is unaware or unconcerned about petty deceptions. It speaks a lot more of God's grace and, and forbearance when we don't receive immediately what we have coming. God loves the truth. And so the truth needs to be important to us, too. So we got to recognize that. we got to live into that, that our life together is completely dependent upon that integrity. We can't have a rich and vital and thriving life as sisters and brothers in the church if we don't trust each other to tell the truth. Without the truth, there's always going to be that suspicion and that dis-ease. And so we need to start as we mean to go. We need to watch ourselves so that we don't fall into those petty deceptions, those little white lies that are still lies regardless of how white we think they are. Lying about little things leads to lying about big things. And I want to be clear. I'm just following the text. This is the next passage that we come to. I don't think that we've got a, a bigger problem here at Nampa Church of the Brethren than anywhere else with deception. We, we're all, we all struggle with this. But because it has come up in Luke's story, because this is where we are, the Spirit undoubtedly has a word for us, if nothing more than a simple reminder. Maybe, maybe the most significant thing about integrity, about the truth, is this. Everybody wants the truth. Everybody wants the truth. Especially these days, when, when we're lied to at every turn in advertising, in politics, in, in society, in the media, everywhere, we want the truth. We are hungry for it. And I'm not talking about, eh, I got a little appetite for the truth. I'm just feeling a little peckish and I'd like a little bit of the truth. No, no, no. 
I'm talking about hungry for the truth. We are desperate for it. We will die without it. We are starving for the truth. Because there is nothing to eat out there. One of the, the biggest longings, again, these people ask these questions, one of the biggest longings that is expressed by younger generations is the longing for authenticity. They want something real, something true, something honest. It's behind all of that endless scrolling through social media and that, that constant virtual conversation that they're having. It's the heart's ache for a real, authentic relationship. And the only reason that they're not flocking to church, the only reason that the church isn't filling that need, the only reason that we're not scratching that very deep and profound itch It's because sometimes we as a church can't offer them that. We can't offer them what they long for. An authentic relationship because of our own lack of integrity. In the one place where they could find the truth, the truth ends up being in short supply. Instead of truth, We offer them programs and good music and a a sermon that will challenge them a little bit, but mostly make them feel good. Instead of being open and vulnerable and honest ourselves, we put on our Sunday best and we expect them to do the same. We want the same facade. Well, the reason that this story about integrity is so important for the church is is that we need to have this kind of integrity. And it's not something that comes from our will, as if we were able to decide this. It doesn't come from practicing and getting better at the truth, although there is a certain measure of discipline that's involved here. No, what we're talking about, when we talk about being the people of integrity, I think is we're talking about people who are devoted to the one, who is the way, the truth, and the life. When we simply devote ourselves to Jesus, then we are devoting ourselves by definition to the truth. When we value Jesus over whatever fleeting honor or benefit that that deception might get us, then we are a people of the truth. When we are devoted to Jesus, when we put Jesus first then we are living in that authenticity that the lost in the world will absolutely respond to. I love that Tozer thought. As we all turn towards Jesus, then our hearts come together into unity and integrity. So maybe there is a little bit of the evangelical in this text. Maybe it is reaching out to the lost in the world. When the church is what the church is meant to be, when it is a people of integrity, then the lost will be drawn to it like a starving man is drawn to bread. Well, I believe that is the truth. Let's pray. Lord, you know us. There is not a part of our hearts that we can hide from you. There is no deception that you will fall for. And Lord, if we are being honest, that is part of what's in us. A tendency to hide, to cover, to downplay the seriousness of our sin. Lord, when we are less than honest, 
and less than truthful, we ask your forgiveness. And Lord, we know that you are faithful to forgive and that you love us. But we don't want to turn that love and that willingness to forgive into an excuse to continue to be deceptive. So I pray that you would tear down the walls and the facades and the false self that we put forward. Help us to be open and honest with each other and with you so that we might present to the world the truth that is Jesus. We pray these things in his precious name. Amen. Please stand. Awake, arise, O sing a new song. It is a new day, sisters and brothers. Every day is another chance. Every day is another opportunity to love and to be loved. If you would bow with me. Lord, we thank you for the patience and the grace that you have with us. And we will not, will not waste it. We're going to go out into the world, Lord, and we're going to share your love with others. We are going to proclaim your gospel in both word and deed. And we will be honest a people of integrity. Lord, again, we pray for those that can't be with us. We ask that you would bless them in a special way, those that are, that are watching the service a little later. We ask a blessing on them. For those that are traveling, we ask that you would keep them safe. For those that are sick, we ask that you would touch their bodies. And Lord, we look forward to the time when you will bring us back together again so that we can praise and worship you because it is a foretaste of that glorious reunion that we will yet enjoy. I pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. You may go in peace.